My name is Frances Owen. I'm a naturalist at Johnson County Conservation, and I'm really excited to be talking with all of you about winter foraging. Specifically, we're going to focus on a location, Chungluska Wakan, um, that is one of our newer properties, and it's just south of Solon. It was for a small or a short period of time known as the Schwab Burford acquisition. You may have heard, heard it referred to as that or seen it in print as that. Um, it was before that known as the Celebration Barn, not to be confused with the Celebration Farm, which is just off of Highway 1. Um, now its official name is Chungleska Wakan, which is a Lakota word for um, basically the sacred hoop or the interconnectedness of all things. So we're really excited to have it have this really meaningful name. Um, if you haven't been out to the property before, one of the reasons it has that name is because of all of the other circular things there. Um, it, it has a lot of round barns, which are really fascinating. There's some really cool architecture there. So hopefully you will get out and explore this property if you haven't been there yet. All right, so Today, we're going to go over a couple of different things. We're going to talk first of all about foraging safety and ethics. And I always think this is a, a really good way to start talking about foraging. I like to start all of my programs this way, even if I know I'm talking to people who have been foraging before and have been to some of my programs before. Um, I just think it's a really important thing to discuss. We're going to go over four specific plants. Now, there are a ton of plants that you can forage during the winter. Um, I tried to keep it to four specifically for this property and for kind of what was available and what I could find easily there. Uh, and then we're going to go over a few useful tools that will hopefully add to this program and enrich it a little bit further for you. So. Um, GeoTourist, which some of you may be familiar with. I'm hoping it's a new thing for some of you as well. Uh, iNaturalist, which is one of my favorite um, resources to have on my phone. And then also I'll point you toward our blog for some additional resources specific to this program. All right, so we're going to talk about um, some of the rules of foraging. And I like to use this acronym, ITEMS. Um, so we'll start with I. So I, I stands for identity. Um, we always want to make sure we're 110% sure of the identity of a plant, fungus, anything that we're going to put into our mouth or on our bodies and ingest. We should be sure that you are properly identifying things. There can be plants that will look very similar. I have two examples here of poison hemlock on the left, which is extremely poisonous and then wild carrot on the right, which is very, very edible. Um, in fact, all parts of it pretty much are, are edible at different, different times of the year. So their leaves can look pretty similar. There are some pretty, there are some really good distinctions between the two, but you have to know those distinctions and, uh, and make sure that you're following. And one of them is the wild carrot has little hairs all over the leaves. Um, while poison hemlock does not have any hairs. There are a couple of differences besides that, but you know, you get the point. You just wanna make sure that you're very, very, very certain that you know the identifying characteristics of the plant and, and any lookalikes that may be poisonous. All right, the next one in our acronym is time of year. So this is, goes along with a couple of things. Um, I like to think of when you can eat the plant. Um, some plants are actually not edible during some parts of the year. The plant I have pictured here is um, called pokeberry or poke salad is sometimes what people refer to it as. But it is an edible green in the spring um, before it gets you know more than seven inches or so or more specifically before the stalks begin to turn red. But after that point, it begins to be poisonous. Um, once the leaves and stalks begin to get that red color to them, which is really beautiful, 
um, you actually can't eat them anymore. So it's important to know when can you eat something. Um, and then also to be able to identify them during different seasons. So some plants, excuse me, <coughs> some plants are going to, you know, all plants are really, they're going to change seasonally. Um, most of our plants right now are very dried out. They look very different from, from their spring, summer, fall um, appearances. And uh, many of them can be eaten during various different seasons. So it's a good idea to identify them during different seasons, not only because they may be edible um, during those other times of year, but also it can help you identify locations where to find that plant. If you know what it looks like during the winter, but you can only eat it in the spring or summer, then you'll be able to scout out and find where that plant is before it's time to harvest. All right, environment. This one is, uh, is extremely important and I think sometimes overlooked. Um, so can you forage there? So um, do you have permission to forage in a location? That's always important. Uh, in, in our public areas, so in all of our Johnson County conservation areas, you are able to forage pretty much anything as long as you are Know, leave no trace um, and not, not damaging the vegetation or, or damaging anything. So if you ever have any questions, you know, you can always ask our park rangers specifically. Um, you can get in contact with them. You can contact the naturalists at Johnson County Conservation and we can help you find out if you need permission to forage in that area. Usually it's not a big deal. Um, the things that you're probably going to forage aren't damaging anything. Um, but you always just want to make sure, and especially make sure if you're going anywhere that isn't on one of our properties. Um, the other thing is, should you forage in that environment? Is it safe? Um, you know, road ditches are a really good example of this. Road ditches aren't, you know, a lot of times I'll see all kinds of fabulous things to forage from there, but do you want to forage out of a road ditch? Has it been sprayed? Um, what kind of petrochemicals are uh, kind of leached into the soil in that location and may be getting uptaken by, by those plants. Um, you know, pay attention to the environment. I have this picture right here by, um, this is actually at Peckman Creek Delta in the slough. Um, and flooding can be, can be something that can potentially make something a little less desirable to, to eat. Um, so if you're foraging in an area that frequently floods or has recently flooded, you are better off not consuming anything that has been flooded over, you know, wait until there's new growth um, that comes up. Um, just because, you know, we live in a very agricultural area. There's a lot of runoff, a lot of things that can end up on the plants. All right, so method, moving on. Um, how are you going to prepare that thing, that food that you're going to eat? Um, some things need cooked, some things can be eaten raw, um, some things, are just not edible, not tasty, um, unless you prepare them a specific way. So the method of preparation is, is really important. And the last piece I wanna talk about is sustainability. Should you harvest that plant? Um, so the picture up here that I have as an example is of spring beauty, which the entire plant really is edible. Um, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves, it also has an edible um, tuber underneath the ground. It's very small, um, but you can, you can roast it and, and eat those kind of in a similar way to potatoes, although the texture will be, will be different than a potato. Um, but if you harvest the root of a plant, that plant is not going to live, right? That plant is dead. Um, if you harvest too many of the leaves of this plant, you're also going to kill the plant. This is a spring ephemeral that pops up with, you know, a few leaves, um, quickly, quickly reproduces and then kind of senesces and disappears and you don't see it for the rest of the year. So there are quite a few spring ephemerals like that and um, that you really need to be mindful of whether you should harvest that plant or not. If you're in a giant field of 
of spring beauties and you want to try a couple of the roots and they're just, you know, the entire forest floor is loaded with them, I'd say you'd be fine to take a couple. Um, but if everyone takes, you know, enough to feed their family um, a giant feast of uh, spring beauty roots, then, uh, you know, that area is going to quickly deplete. So we want to be mindful of of whether we should be harvesting a plant, which is why I often like to focus on um, non-native plants if I can, or uh, types of plants that, you know, if you harvest leaves or pieces from that plant that it's not actually going to harm the plant in any way. All right, so we're going to start, um, speaking of invasives, we're going to start with uh, our plants now. And so this is the multiflora rose and uh, Multiflora rose have, you know, I've always been aware of them as since I was a young kid as kind of being the bane of a lot of, a lot of uh, cattle, cattle raisers um, existences because it, along with Canada thistle um, or musk thistle, I should say not Canada thistle as much, um, they really can reduce the amount of pasture land available. Um, so they're, they're not native to Iowa, they're native to Asia specifically China, Japan, and Korea. They were brought over to be used as a natural fence. So they, you know, they do have thorns on them like most other roses. And so they would keep, keep uh, you know, livestock in, keep other undesirable things out. Um, they were also planted to prevent erosion. So their roots would hold the soil in place. You know, we know now that there are tons of native plants that are really great at that too, that we can use instead. Um, they're also planted to attract wildlife. So they do have some really beautiful flowers um, that attract a lot of pollinators and, uh, and the rose hips, um, the fruits that are, can become a food for wildlife. Um, so they're considered a noxious weed. They're very aggressive and difficult to get out of an area. You really have to trim them back um, often and a lot of times it really isn't easy to get rid of them unless you use chemicals. So multiflora rose, um, specifically the hips are what I'm usually interested in, um, the rose hips. So if you look again at this first picture on the far left, those are the, the fruits of the plant. And all roses produce hips. Uh, they have varying degree of edibility and tastiness, I guess. They're all, I'm not aware of any roses that produce a hip that would be bad for you or poisonous, um, but it just might not taste good. And sometimes you'll have individual multiflora rose bushes that will not taste as great as others. So, um, you know, if you try it once off of a plant, don't let that be the only time that you try it. Make sure you try it off of a different one um, just to see how the flavor can change. So they can be eaten raw or fresh. And fresh and raw, the, the rose hips contain more vitamin C per 100 grams than an orange. So that's amazing, right? If you're, uh, if you're out walking around and you just want a quick um, little trail snack, you can pop a rose hip in your mouth and chew it around. They do have a little seed in the, um, in the middle. And with the multiflora rose hips, you know they are pretty small. Um, try to dispose of the seed. I usually, if I'm, if I'm chewing on uh, seeds from invasive plants out on the trail, I usually give the seed a little crunch um, just to destroy it before I spit it out. Um, I don't think swallowing it would have any problem. I don't think you'd have any problems with swallowing it either. Um, but if you dry or cook the hips, they lose most of their vitamin C, which is the case with a lot of, um, a lot of other plants and uh, foods that are very high in vitamin C, they tend to lose some of those nutrients when they're cooked. Um, out of season, but also edible are the flowers. So those can be eaten raw or cooked and those will be ready in the spring. So, you know, I'll just kind of get y'all thinking about that now um, and ready for it. The leaves also can be eaten raw or cooked. Um, and so there are some leaves out there right now, currently, um, since they're not native to here, they don't follow the same rules as, you know, a lot of our native plants. You won't see them um, flowering or, um, you know, leafing out until it gets a little bit warmer. 
All right, so some of you are probably already familiar with what this plant looks like, but it's a woody shrub and the ones at Chingleska Wakan, specifically there are some monstrously large multiflora rows and it's one of the things that we're going to be spending a fair bit of time um, removing from that property. The rest, you know, most of the property is really beautiful, has amazing open, mature, high quality woodland, um, but there are some small sections that are just filled with really large multiflora rose shrubs. Um, so they are very shrub-like um, there with some very large ones. Um, they're armored with backward pointing thorns. So on the bottom right, you can see what their thorns look like. Um, look like pretty typical rose thorns if you have roses at home or you take care of them. Uh, the vines can be green or red colored. Um, most of them right now that I've been seeing are pretty, you know, pretty brown with kind of a reddish, reddish tinge to them. The leaves are pinnately compound, which just means like they're, um, they're a compound leaf. So they have five to 11 leaflets. And if you look at the bottom left picture, um, that was a picture that I just took of one that was leafing out. And so those, you could definitely forage those younger leaves there. Um, and so you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on that particular leaf. Um, I also want to caution that you don't want to confuse it with oriental bittersweet berries. Unfortunately, when I was just out there scouting for this program, I could not find any multiflora rose hips. And usually I can find them all the way into winter. Um, one thing to consider right now is that you know, we've had snow on the ground for a while and a lot of the wildlife is probably you know, maybe getting a little bit desperate looking for food and having difficulty um, finding things that are maybe on the ground. And so I think most of those rose hips have been picked over by the birds at this point and maybe some other little rodents and things. Um, so, you know, that is one thing, another piece of the sustainability um, that we didn't talk about yet is you know, thinking about the value for wildlife for some of these things. Now, multiflora rose is one of those plants that I honestly would rather harvest all of the rose hips and uh, not let the wildlife have them because um, I don't want them to be distributed and spread to other areas. They can actually decrease the amount of diversity in an area and, you know, when these plants really take over and can make it, um, you know, more of a you know, have fewer fewer options for animals to consume. I would rather plant some native native fruit producing shrubs to replace this plant. Um, so this is just a, a picture illustrating the difference between the multiflora rose and the bittersweet berries. Um, the rose hips have that uh, little like flower scar basically where the flower kind of was um, growing out and then the the fruit actually grows out of grows out of the ovary of the flower, um, and so it grows out of the base where the petals were, basically. Um, and then the Oriental bittersweet berries are pretty spherical, um, as opposed to more oval, ovate shaped. And uh, this time of year, most of their little casings have popped off, but the Oriental bittersweet berries also get these. They're really beautiful, <laughs> um, and also unfortunately very invasive. Um, and poisonous, but they have these really beautiful orange casings that fit over each of the berries. And you can see a couple of those casings on the picture here. If you look, um, they're kind of yellowish. So don't eat those, um, but please enjoy the rose hips if you can find them. So um, kind of to conclude the multiflora rose. The hips, flowers, and leaves can be eaten both raw or cooked. Um, and you know, we, just to touch on this again, when heated or dried, the hips do lose much of their vitamin C content, which is really unfortunate. Um, but again, if you want to get the most of that vitamin C content, you can try snacking on them um, on the trail fresh. Um, I would recommend trying some tea from the hips if you can find them. Again, I had a hard time finding any out at, uh, at Chingleska Wakan the other day, um, but you can also use the leaves as an addition to salads or soups. And then 
you know, keep in mind that when the flowers come into season, you can use them as a garnish. Um, they look really beautiful. You could even, um, you know, press and dry them and use them in, in baked goods. Um, be really beautiful. Um, I do want to, again, iterate at this point uh, that I have some recipes for each of these plants that we're going to be talking about. I have some recipes that are uploaded onto our blog. Um, and so all of you will have access to some of those additional resources. All right, let's move on to the next one if there aren't any questions. All right, so garlic mustard is our next one. And I love talking about garlic mustard. Um, it is one of my favorite plants to forage. It is also one of my least favorite plants to find <laughs> in a forest. Um, so as with the multiflora rose, it's native to Europe. It was introduced to North America as a food plant. People grew it in their gardens. And uh, it's, it is in the mustard family, but it quickly, quickly escaped those gardens and invaded woodlands. And uh, unfortunately, well, Fortunately for the plant, it has this really cool um, way to, you know, kind of take over an area and thrive. Um, it's called allelopathy, or it's it's known as being allelopathic. So it releases compounds into the soil around it that inhibit the growth of many other plants, and so it can actually. Um, suppress the growth of other vegetation, which allows it to really take over in an area. So the reason I like talking about this plant is um, the greens are so high in a lot of different vitamins. So vitamin A, C, E, calcium, iron. Um, there's also medicinal uses for garlic mustard. So you can actually use the leaves on the skin to relieve insect bites and stings. You can kind of mash it up and use it as a poultice. Um, so that's pretty cool. And it is also, um, also unfortunately, pretty widely available. Um, the great thing about it is that it's uh, a great way to get rid of it, to actually pull it and uproot the entire plant. Um, and so when you do that, you can eat pretty much the entire plant. You can get a lot of use out of that plant um, for pulling it. So it's just another added incentive to get out there and pull out some of that garlic mustard. Um, so the flowers can be eaten. So again, a lot of these things are not available during the winter. Um, the flowers are available in springtime, early summer, and they can be eaten raw or cooked, honestly, but they look really beautiful just kind of as a garnish on salads or um, savory dishes. You can eat the leaves and the leaves are available all year round. Um, I have a picture coming up that shows garlic mustard poking out through through ice and through the snow. So the leaves are down there. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to find them right now, but the leaves are down there if you're wanting to have a little bit of, a, of an adventure and, and dig for some of those greens. And they can be eaten raw or cooked. The seeds, which will be available in the summer and autumn, can be eaten raw um, or thrown in as a seasoning. Um, they have, it's hard to describe the flavor of the seeds. They taste a little bit different than the, than the plant, um, but they are also a really good seasoning. Um, the root can also be eaten and it can be eaten, I should have put on there, it can be eaten raw or cooked as well. Um, it takes a lot of the roots to actually make anything that you can really use. Uh, it's a lot of work to get those roots, but um, and I'm not sure if I mention it later, but you can make like a horseradish kind of sauce out of them, which is kind of fun. So if you're going to try to identify this plant, if you aren't super familiar with it yet, it is biennial, so it means it um, kind of has two main growth years. The first year of growth is low to the ground. They have these kind of kidney-shaped leaves, um, almost heart-shaped, but they don't really have, a, have much of a point. And there's this deep lobe here on the leaf where the stem attaches to the ground or to the plant. Um, they have these delicate kind of scalloped edges the second year growth can go up to three feet tall. And so 
it does get pretty large and again kind of shades out the area it grows really quickly in the spring and can block out the light from a lot of really amazing spring ephemerals it has small four petaled blooms which are white and those bloom early in the spring and then if all else fails pick the leaf smash it up and smell it um, and if it doesn't smell like you know garlic or I have a lot of kids say that it smells like pizza um, it doesn't have that smell then you don't have the right plant um, and you'll want to make sure what you're eating is is what you think it is um, so this is again this picture on the bottom right corner is that picture of the plants growing up through through the snow and ice and there are quite a few greens that you can harvest all the way through the winter that are just, you know, if it's snowed, they're hidden underneath that layer of snow and ice. So garlic mustard can be eaten raw, cooked, or dried. Um, you can dry it as an herb to use later. You can freeze it, which is nice. Um, and some people are actually sensitive to it raw. Freezing or cooking can reduce that sensitivity. And that has from my understanding, that has to do with the allelopathic tendencies of the plant. Um, it actually produces small amounts of cyanide, which is not unusual for plants. Um, there are quite a few other plants that will produce small amounts of cyanide specifically to prevent or reduce herbivory. Um, it, it usually only affects like tiny insects and things that are small, not large mammals like us. Um, but some people are more sensitive to cyanide than others. Um, I tend to not have any reaction to it. And uh, only last spring met my first person that, um, that, you know, always has just like a little bit of an upset um, stomach whenever they eat garlic mustard in large amounts. So, you know, with, with anything, make sure that you're consuming in moderation until you know how you're going to react to something. Um, but if you are reacting to it and you still want to give it a go, um, you can try freezing or cooking. You can toss the leaves into soups, which would again be cooking. It wilts really quickly and makes a really nice cooked green. Um, toss it into salads or try some pesto. Um, on the blog that goes along with this, I include a recipe for my favorite um, kind of pesto, um, pesto sauce that uh, is made from garlic mustard. It, it's really delicious. I'd highly rec recommend trying it. Um, let's see here. Our third species is going to be shag bark hickory. And uh, so this is a native. <laughs> All of the other ones we've talked about are non-native. Let's talk about some of the amazing plants that are out at this property that are supposed to be there and very healthy for the ecosystem. Um, so it's a very distinctive looking tree in the forest. It has this super shaggy bark, um, hence the name shag bark, that actually exfoliates from the tree. So it'll peel off eventually from the tree and fall down and you find it scattered around the base of the tree. And because of those pieces of bark that kind of flake off, they create these little, um, you know, nice little homes, hangouts for, uh, for bats, um, specifically the Indiana bat, which is federally endangered, really likes to roost up in those little um, shaggy, shaggy bark areas. All right, so I, I recently found this out that some Native American tribes used the bark as a tonic for, they just said general debility in the place that I found this and, and arthritis. And as a flavoring for meats and sugar, which people, um, People do all the time now, right? We have hickory smoked meats and things like that. Um, and then the nuts contain high quantities of protein, um, 3.6 grams. This is all per, um, per 100 grams of the, the food. Um, high amounts of fat, vitamin B1, magnesium, and phosphorus. Um, so we're going to talk mostly right now, this, this time of year, about the bark. Um, and the bark can be steeped into a tea. And then that tea can either be drank, drank as a tea, or it can be made into a tasty syrup or flavoring for other culinary concoctions, which is really fun. Um, and then the nut 
can be eaten raw or cooked. And the bark can be harvested really any time of year, um, but the nut is easiest to find in autumn right when the nuts are actually dropping. It can be difficult to compete with the wildlife to harvest, harvest these nuts. Specifically, there are some weevils that can be really difficult. Um, you know, if you pick up the nut and, or if you find any nuts this time of year, uh, most of them are probably infested with that weevil or have a little tiny uh, bore hole coming out of the nut. And the, you know, the squirrels knew to just leave that nut that it wasn't worth it. Um, but you can still try cracking it open and see what you find inside. Francis, would you suggest um, harvesting from the tree or would you suggest harvesting what's fallen on the ground? Yeah, so we'll talk about that because the, okay. um, we'll talk about that in an upcoming slide, but yeah, because of that exfoliating bark, the bark laying around the ground is actually what you want to harvest. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the shag bark hickory, um, Identification, again, those large chunks of peeling bark are going to be very characteristic of this tree. Um, if you can find the leaves, the leaves are large and compound, typically five leaflets on one leaf. Uh, and there's a picture, the bottom, bottom right picture is what those leaves look this, like this time of year. Sometimes they'll still be attached to the tree. Um, if they're not completely covered in snow, you can find them on the ground too, and that can just be a ground proofing you can do to make sure that you have the plant. And then also the buds, the buds are really fun. They're large and, and very fuzzy. Um, so I'm gonna try to get my lights turned back on. Um, so the buds are very large and fuzzy, and uh, you know, if you can find them, you know, they're, they just feel nice, you should touch them and see if they're fuzzy. <laughs> um, so yeah, the as far as, you know, some of my recommended preparations, the nut meat can be eaten and it is very tasty. It's um, in the same family as pecans. So the, the nuts actually have a very similar, like sweet, sweet nut flavor. Um, something I have wanted to try with the nuts and I just have never been able to find enough of them to make it worthwhile. Um, is uh, you can actually create a nut milk from them. And it's one of the easier ways to process the nuts because you can just um, basically put them in a sack and break them all open with a hammer, just mash them really well, and then toss them all into a pot of water and kind of cook them down and um, leach, leach a lot of the, the flavoring and goodness from the, the nut meat in there. And then you can strain that instead of, you know, sometimes if you've looked inside of a, a hickory nut, and I wish I had a picture of one. Um, some species in particular can be very difficult to pick the nut meat out of the intricate little parts of the shell. Um, but the way that I would recommend trying right now, um, which is very easy to get a hold of, is doing something with the bark. Um, so the tea is really delicious. Um, uh, basically, and I, again, I'll include this recipe on our blog, but the tea uh, and the syrup have the same origins. You essentially um, gather bark from the tree. And so thank you again for bringing that up. We don't want to harvest the bark that's actually attached to the tree. We only want to harvest bark that has fallen down to the ground. Um, sometimes, sometimes you may find bark that is like very loosely attached and just barely hanging on. That would be okay to grab. But if we pull that bark off of the tree, it can actually, you know, it's like the skin of the tree and it protects the tree from, um, from any kind of infection that might get into it, it can open it up for, for insects or fungus, uh, bacteria. So we wanna make sure that we only harvest the bark that is around the ground. Um, and this time of year, it's still pretty easy to find it even though there's a lot of snow. Um, just very quickly, I did some like little test digs around at uh, Chenglaska Wakan to see what kind of bark was available. And I was able to find um, a couple pieces really quickly and then I just kind of stopped. Um, you can use the bark multiple times. So the way you get um, that flavor from them is you actually um, roast the bark in the oven and then you create a tea with the bark by steeping it in, in a pot of of water and uh, straining it. And then again, you can drink it as a tea. And I, I don't have anything in this 
presentation about it, but I think I think the tea itself, the bark even has some um, like magnesium is probably the the biggest um, nutritional benefit that you would get from it. Um, but then you can also put um, you know you can to that tea you can add sugar <laughs> and make a syrup that is also quite delicious. Um, you can add you know you can add it to ice creams to give them fun flavors. You can really just experiment with, um, with different, different, uh, recipes. Um, another thing, and again, a lot of this is in that recipe, um, that will be on our blog, but you want to make sure that you find pieces that either don't have a lot of lichen on them, or you want to actually shave, uh, lichen off of it. Cause it can, I've read that it can impart kind of a bitter flavoring to the tea. I haven't ever tried it. Cause I just, I always make sure I get bark that doesn't have the lichen on it. All right, so this is our last, last plant we're going to talk about, the Eastern Cottonwood. Um, this picture is actually from Kent Park on the right side. We have some really beautiful, um, and now I'm, yeah, we have some really beautiful cottonwoods out at Kent Park. Um, so they're fast growing. They can get to be over 100 feet tall, um, and they can, fill the air with cotton, which if you've seen that um, in the spring, they um, just release large amounts of flowy seeds that um, float through the air and it can look like it's snowing. It's really lovely. Um, and that's where it gets its name, the cottonwood. The wood is softer than some other slower growing trees and the branches are quick to break off during windstorms because of that, um, because they grow so quickly um, the, the wood is less dense than something like an oak tree um, or a hickory tree for that matter. Um, so the aftermath of the storms is a great time to forage and we'll talk about what we forage, we get their buds. So this is less of a, a food and more of a medicinal kind of salve use. Um, the buds contain tannins and a resin um, so there's this kind of sticky resin on the bud, if you've ever touched the buds, that's used in some healing salves. So Balm of Gilead um, is a, medic a medicinal salve made with oils infused with the resin from poplar trees. Um, so this has a, a beneficial antifungal, antimicrobial, and anti-inflammatory properties. And it also, along with other those, those other things, it contains salicin, which is the precursor to aspirin. It's the same, so salicin is the same compound you find in willow bark um, as well, which is why, you know, people have, have used willow bark um, to, you know, as an aspirin um, adjacent plant um, or a natural, natural medicinal. Um, the buds can be, you, know, you can kind of get that, um, that me those medicinal properties, that resin specifically that you're trying to get out by steeping the bud, um, either in alcohol or oil is the way that I've done it a couple times that I've done it. You can also eat the leaves, which I have not done yet. Um, I have eaten a lot of other leaves from trees. Um, Basswood has has edible edible leaves and maple trees have edible leaves. If you get them young enough, I imagine it'd be kind of similar tasting to those. Not the best flavor, kind of bitter, <laughs> um, but you can eat the leaves raw or cooked early in the spring when you have fresh tender leaves. It's definitely something I'm going to try this spring because I have not have not tried cottonwood leaves yet. And you can harvest the buds at any time during the year. Um, this time of year is, you know, the spring and winter and spring are, you're gonna get the larger, larger sized buds um, before they pop. Um, but you can really harvest them any time of year. So let's talk about identification. Uh, the bark on cottonwood trees is thick and deeply furrowed in the older trees specifically. If you look up in the younger branches, the and end on younger trees, the bark will be much tighter to the tree and a lot smoother. 
Um, but you can also look at things like the leaves. Um, often you'll find the leaves by kind of ground proofing or if you look around, there'll be limbs that are around that might have the leaves hanging off of them still. Um, the leaves are triangular shaped and they have that pointed tip. Uh, and that is illustrated in that top right photo. Have that little pointed tip here. Almost heart shaped, kind of have a flat, flat bottom where the, the top of the heart should be. And they have these curved saw teeth on the edges as well. Buds and leaves are arranged alternately. Um, so if you look at this bottom picture, instead of being directly across from each other, which is the case for opposite, um, oppositely arranged leaves and branches, these are alternately arranged. So we have a bud here, and then we skip up to a bud here, skip up. And so that is an alternate arrangement. And the buds also are pretty large. They have kind of this, usually have like a yellowish green color to them. And if it's a warmer day, um, you can feel them and they can feel pretty sticky as well. And that's that resin. Sometimes you can even see the resin dripping out of the bud um, as kind of an orangish yellow color coming out of the bud. So the buds can actually be eaten just as a trail nibble. I'm not that impressed by it. <laughs> I read, I don't know, a couple years ago about just snacking on cottonwood buds. And so I obviously had to try it and uh, not a big fan. Um, there are some people that um, some, for some other foragers I've read accounts from have said they, um, you know, they will nibble the bud. Um, and swallow, you know, if they have like a sore throat, you know, kind of the thought is that that salicin uh, in the in the bud and the resin can could help soothe it. Um, I haven't tried that, um, you know. So consuming small amounts of them um, is, should be fine. Um, the the resin from the buds can be used fresh or infused into oil. So. Um, fresh, you can actually, you know, I mentioned how the resin can sometimes see, be seen actually dripping out of the bud. Um, say you have like a, a bug bite or um, I recently read that people sometimes use them on cold sores even um, and a, a dab of the oil on there, um, they claim makes the, makes the cold so sore, all, you know, not only hurt less but also heal faster. Um, my preferred way of using the cottonwood bud is to infuse it into oil. I have not done an alcohol infusion yet, um, but I've infused it into olive oil specifically. And this picture on the top is a pot of cottonwood buds that I had slow simmering in, in olive oil on my stove for, uh, for a couple hours. Um, the better way to infuse the oil, and I think I mentioned this in the, in the recipe, if you want to try making some balm of Gilead at home, um, is to, I believe, use, um, like I have a small crock pot for like, you know, little sauces and stuff for parties. Um, and so uh, I think I, I, I've actually been using the pot a lot for infusing oils from like dandelions and plantain and stuff like that. So you can flip it on warm. Um, if it has a warm setting in that little crock pot, add your oil and your buds and you can let that sit overnight and do a slow infusion. Um, some people actually just leave the buds in a jar of oil and let it sit in like a windowsill for a week or so. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to infuse the oil. Um, if you're going to try it, you know, you might want to try a few different ways. The picture on the bottom is um, what I have made, um, just a, a salve that has, I guess, more of a balm. Um, it has beeswax in it and the olive oil infused with the, the cottonwood buds. Um, and it does, it does have a pretty soothing um, effect from, from my, uh, my uses of of it. So, you know, I definitely, um, definitely would give it a try if you're into trying new balms and things like that and making, making little things like that. All right. 
So we're almost done um, with all the information I wanted to get through. The, uh, the additional resources I wanted to share with you, um, one of them is the GeoTourist app. So I actually created a virtual, or not virtual, an actual tour, a walking tour, guided walking tour out at Chingleska Wakan that y'all can go and do at your own pace, at your own time. And that will be available on GeoTourist until the plants are out of season. So, um, you know, come the end of winter, spring, I'll probably take that off of, off of GeoTourist. Um, so that is that's completely free. The app is free to download. And you'll just, once you get into the app, you can search for tours that are near me. Um, there's a, a couple other ones that are kind of around this area. Lynn County has a couple as well of a couple of their parks. Um, and so you can search for that and, and walk around and find those four plants. And again, um, the garlic mustard specifically, that one's going to be difficult to get to with all the snow on the ground. You know, if you want to try harvesting some of the leaves and uh, feel industrious, um, you know, grab a little little hand trowel maybe and help you help you dig it out. That'll help you get um, some of the hickory hickory bark too, honestly, if you want to try to dig around the base of the tree and look for that. Another really awesome app that I would highly recommend is iNaturalist. So if you don't use that already, it's not only a really great tool for identifying things, you literally take a picture of any kind of living thing. I've taken a picture of a, a like a weasel skull and it has identified it almost perfectly. Um, you can, I often use it for plants. Um, so you can take a picture of, of bark, buds, leaves, anything and upload it onto this, um, this app and it will automatically match it to an enormous library of pre-identified plants. And so it's able to very quickly narrow it down. Sometimes it gets the identity perfect down to species. Other times it's a little bit further away and it might just get you into a family or, or close, close to it. There's also a huge community of people on this, this application that will identify other people's sightings, other people's plants, animals, um, funguses, it works really great for mushrooms too. Um, so it's a really great identification tool. It also allows you to log all of your own sightings. And so you can keep track of phenology. I um, mean, keep track of when you've been looking and what you've found every time you go hiking. Um, and it will, can help you, you know, pinpoint it onto a map too. It'll also help you remember where things are. Um, that being said, if you find something, you know, a rare plant or your favorite morel hunting place and you upload it to this website, um, it is available for anyone to look at at that point. And so you probably just want to be picky about what, um, what you upload into that spot for the sake of both your favorite foraging places and uh, potentially of the plant and ecology of the area. Um, the last thing that I wanted to share, and I mentioned again, um, our blog, jccnaturenotes.wordpress.com. So it's a WordPress site that we started last spring. Um, I will, tomorrow, I will be going live with the, the page that has all of these additional resources on them. It'll have a link to this presentation. It'll also have a link to the full recording of this presentation. And then it'll have all of the resources on there for you. So all of the recipes and everything. 